And that's your biggest worry? Yes, any kind of virus, but most probably something similar to influenza. The HBO adaptation notably goes back to a televised scientific discussion on epidemiology in 1968, much more time than the 20-year gap between the intro and the main story in the game. The aim of this is twofold. First, to create a sense that perhaps humanity should have seen this coming, and perhaps even we, the audience, should see this coming in our own real world. It's a fairly common trope in zombie stories. Take World War Z, another one that devotes a much shorter and much less effective intro to this sort of indictment of how humanity whistled past the graveyard, the greatest threat to its extinction right under its nose for years, but completely unnoticed in the miasma of the rest of the world's issues. World War Z accomplishes this with a cacophony of stimuli, both auditory and visual. As brief shots of our vast world showing commuters, pollution, airport traffic, and stock markets are overlaid by multiple news reporters all speaking at the same time, making it impossible to understand what they're saying, coupled with the eerie, fast-paced music. Until one voice separates itself from the rest, allowing the audience to hear what we know should have been humanity's warning sign. This will be a different scenario, the virus changes in a way that allows transmission between humans only to immediately cut to celebrity as we are so liable to do with our collective short attention span. The rest of the intro shows the virus's havoc being wreaked on animal life as global warming continues unabated, yet the threat is never treated as serious. Until, of course, it was too late for humanity. We'll explore the warning humanity received in 1968 in The Last of Us TV show in this video. The second aim of this intro is to establish the kind of story this will be. A more grounded, realistic zombie story. Not one with an outbreak that just happens with no explanation, or one with a made-up virus or bioengineered government experiment gone wrong. Even though that could always happen. The disease is the same name as the lab. No, this one takes something from our world that we've studied the effects of, and posits a somewhat believable explanation for how those effects could manifest in humans. In doing so, it creates a sense of fear that undergirds this story more than other zombie movies, shows, video games, or books. There's a real sense that this outbreak could happen. In fact, that it's already out there in some form. Because of air travel. Through the air. Coughing. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I meant people on planes. Uh, that was something you described in your book. Yes, a new virus in Madagascar, say, could be in Chicago within a matter of weeks. The first scientist is speaking about his worst-case scenario for a possible pandemic namely a virus that spreads throughout the globe with the aid of air travel, something we in 2024 know about all too well. The audience showcased is small and listening intently. This doesn't seem to be a late-night talk show or something like that, rather a show for science enthusiasts. So the second doctor's warning only reached a small number of people, and no serious widespread concern was given to it. And we end up with a global pandemic. Pan meaning all, the whole world becomes sick all at once. Hmm. Here we get a good look at our panel. The variance in body language is striking. The interviewer is composing himself as the host of an intellectual television program would. He's not quite relaxed, but comfortable, leg crossed onto his knee, sitting up straight, attentive and thoughtful. Not so laid back as Craig Ferguson, and not so antsy and ready to let off a fake laugh as Jimmy Fallon. The guest currently speaking on viruses, Dr. Schoenheis, as he's identified later on in the scene, is sitting as I personally would like all my scientists and engineers to sit. Stiff-backed, knees at 90-degree angles, head unmoving as he doesn't break eye contact with the host, and hands on his knees as though he was either taught strict manners or he doesn't know what to do with them. Exhibiting the signs of social awkwardness that I, as an engineer, have seen an innumerable amount of times. And then we get to Dr. Newman. As Dr. Schoenheis expresses his concern about the dangers of potential viral pandemics, he hardly even seems to be paying attention. He's beyond comfortable. He's relaxed, uninterested in the explanation his colleague is droning on about as he takes a long drag of a cigarette. As though, as an epidemiologist, he's heard all this before and isn't phased. As though he knows something that no one else here knows, which, of course, he does. When Dr. Newman is asked if he concurs with Dr. Schoenheis' concerns, he gives a lazy no in response, without initially even offering a further explanation. And uh, Dr. Newman, you're also an epidemiologist. I presume the prospect of a viral pandemic keeps you up at night as well. No. No? No. All right, well, that's our show. <laughs> the host turns Newman's brief and dead-ended answer into a quick laugh line, as television hosts must be adept at doing. 
keep in the atmosphere light surrounding what is at its core quite a maudlin topic of discussion. The tone of this discussion changes here from didactic, as Tightwad over here droned on about viral air travel, to now borderline humorous, as the response Dr. Newman is about to deliver is initially met with unseriousness. No, mankind has been at war with the virus from the start. Quick shot of another man smoking a cigarette indoors to drive home the feel of this being in the 1960s. It's a bit cliche, but that's no reason not to have it if it's accurate. Sometimes millions of people die as in an actual war, but in the end, we always win. This is the first indication that Dr. Newman is about to deliver a theory containing with it the most dire of stakes. Dr. Newman is a true cold-blooded evolutionary materialist. The suffering and even death of millions of people doesn't seem to concern him all that much, because at the end of the day, humanity will still be standing after being run through by a virus. His concern or perhaps it's merely intrigue, only awakens when the threat of extinction looms. Uh, but you, uh, just to be clear, you, you do think microorganisms pose a threat? Oh, in the most dire terms. Quick note of the setting. Cloaked in muted, cool tones, this show is establishing what it's going to be from the start. Grounded, gritty, rugged. There seems to be no bright spot in the world in the time after the outbreak, so why should there be one when it showcases the man who delivered the warning that ultimately fell on humanity's collective deaf ear? Bacteria. No. You like saying no? Yes. <laughs> Again, the tone stays lighthearted and even comical, even from Dr. Newman, despite knowing the dire warning he is about to drop on this unsuspecting audience. Not bacteria, not viruses, so... Fungus. <laughs> Yes, that's the usual response. Fungi seem harmless enough. Many species know otherwise. Dr. Newman begins his theory, and he receives the response he always receives. But his confidence, his scientific swagger, doesn't waver. The quick shot of the ABC cameramen remind us of the setting we're dealing with, and they, along with some NPCs in the background, lean over to each other, perhaps to scoff at his claim. Because there are some fungi who seek not to kill, but to control. Now, of course, we know what he's referring to, but the in-world audience is still ignorant, so we get this next interaction. Let me ask you, where do we get LSD from? Where do you get it from? <laughs> still lighthearted, even dismissive, as if the joke he's making is that Dr. Newman's ideas are fueled by hallucinogens. It comes from ergot, a fungus. Psilocybin, also a fungus. Viruses can make us ill, but fungi can alter our very minds. The way Dr. Newman sets up his bombshell is superb. He feeds his audience little nuggets of information, seemingly out of science fiction, unrealistic, the ramblings of a madman. But soon he will lift the veil from their eyes that was lifted from his, and they will see just how little they know what to fear. There's a fungus that infects insects, gets inside an ant, for example, travels through its circulatory system to the ant's brain, and then floods it with hallucinogens, thus bending the ant's mind to its will. The cordyceps fungus is well documented, and most, if not all, fans of The Last of Us know what it is at this point. But if you haven't seen it, look up the Planet Earth video on it from like 15 years ago. It's nuts. If you're an ant in the rainforest, good luck, bro. The fungus starts to direct the ant's behavior, telling it where to go, what to do, like a puppeteer with a marionette. And still, the host has a look of amusement on his face, ignorantly and arrogantly thinking he sees exactly the same hole that Dr. Schoenheis is about to poke. We are not ants. He, in his ignorance, does not wonder what Dr. Newman knows that he doesn't. He still sees him as a man who perhaps read too many science fiction novels. And it gets worse. The fungus needs food to live, so it begins to devour its host from within, replacing the ant's flesh with its own. I don't have anything to say about that. That's just gross. Hey, I'm not usually one to interrupt my own video to plug my channel, but it's relevant here. You're clearly probably a fan of The Last of Us if you're still watching, so I'll let you in on a little secret. Leading up to the release of Season 2, I'm going to be taking a deep dive into the story of The Last of Us Part 2 video game. So if that interests you to prep for Season 2, subscribe now. But it doesn't let its victim die, no. It, it keeps its puppet alive by preventing decomposition. How? Where do we get penicillin from? Fungus. <laughs> Once again, the host still greeting Newman's claim with humor. It may seem redundant, as I've commented on it every time it's happened, but when you watch the scene in real time, it flows perfectly. And the best part is, the realization doesn't come gradually. The host doesn't over time see Newman's claims as more and more possible. Dr. Newman has built up a true horror story scenario for his audience, but for now it's just loony science fiction to them. 
Once he turns the light on with one simple qualifier, it hits them like a ton of bricks. Oh. Dr. Schoen, heist, you're in distress. Fungal infection of this kind is real, but not in humans. Nerd! True, fungi cannot survive if its host's internal temperature is over 94 degrees. So that's what's saving us now, our body temperatures. Our body temperatures clock in around 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, and fungi can't survive in host temperatures above 94. This short segment before Dr. Newman drops the anchor is really interesting from a writing standpoint, but we'll discuss it at the end. And currently there are no reasons for fungi to evolve to be able to withstand higher temperatures. But what if that were to change? What if, for instance, the world were to get slightly warmer? And boom, the veil is gone. In 1968, although not nearly to the extent it is now, climate change was a known issue, more limited to those in the scientific community, as this audience is part of. Everyone here knows exactly what this means. Our world is trending towards conditions that could make this science fiction a horrifying reality. And you can see the realization dawn on the host's face. The moment he realizes his lightheartedness had no place here, and the tone immediately changes from cheery to dire. One gene mutates, and an ascomycetia, candida, ergot. And the audience has changed too. No longer laughing, not even smiling. They realize it along with the host. Newman's theory has turned into a warning. Cordyceps, Aspergillus, any one of them could become capable of burrowing into our brain. Just kind of crazy how many kinds of this fungus there are. Didn't even have to be Cordyceps. The world's a cool place. And taking control, not of millions of us, but billions of us. Billions of puppets with poisoned minds permanently fixed on one unifying goal. The shots of the audience here continue to showcase the sharp contrast from the earlier tone. Not a smile to be found. They're wrapped with attention, no longer leaning over to one another to whisper into each other's ears, all hanging on to Dr. Newman's every word. To spread the infection to every last human alive by any means necessary. And there are no treatments for this, no preventatives, no cures. They don't exist. It's not even possible to make them. And here's what we're going to briefly discuss after the scene ends. How The Last of Us uses selective information to manufacture fear. Because of course there are cures for fungal infections. Some are incurable, but this one only exists in ants, so there's literally no way to know whether the future hypothetical mutated fungus would be resistant to any antifungal medication. And no reason to assume it would be. And only now is the first music of the show creeping in, barely audible, having laid dormant for the entirety of the conversation, just as the threat of the cordyceps did for all of humanity's existence. Now, in conjunction with Dr. Newman's warning, it starts to make itself heard. A low drone before the piercing note will punctuate his final words. So if that happens, we lose. Dr. Newman, the prophet, delivers these words with the faintest of crooked smiles, perhaps relishing in the tearing down of his arrogant colleague, host, and audience, or perhaps because he is a neutral observer, simply watching the effects of nature unfold. And if this is the next stage of the Earth's existence, with humanity having manufactured the conditions that led to the evolution of its final extinction mechanism, so be it. <clears throat> We'll be back. The life has been sucked out of the studio, and the stage has been set for the story to come. And I've mentioned the body language of the panelists. If I were the one writing or directing this show, I would have had the host shift in his seat at those words. He taps his foot, but it's not much. And same for straight back over there. I would definitely break his posture, have him slouch those shoulders and sink back into his chair. But what are you going to do? When looking at horror stories, there are two categories of fear they create. And I mean real fear, not jump scares. Fear that stays with us when we leave the theater or put the book down. They create fear in us using that which we can't understand, the supernatural and the science fiction, such as in It or The Exorcist or zombie movies. Or they create fear using that which we understand is very real but typically far from our minds, like in The Silence of the Lambs or Texas Chainsaw Massacre. The Last of Us combines both of these better than just about any story I can think of off the top of my head, taking the supernatural and giving a solid effort to derive it from something we can understand. The other strategy for creating fear I'll touch on before we go is controlling the information the audience is privy to. Often it's lack of information that creates fear in us. 
Not just in stories, but in real life too. You may not be scared of the dark in your own home, but what about in a forest as you hear leaves rustling nearby or twigs snapping? Would you be scared then? You probably should be. I just caught up with an old friend who works in Glacier National Park who got attacked by a grizzly bear a few months ago. How scary would horror movies be if every scene was well lit? Most of them probably not very at all. The Last of Us premise gives the audience selective information. The more information it were to give the audience about the cordyceps and the notion of it mutating to affect humans, the more they would realize this premise is actually one of the least realistic premises for a zombie horror movie ever conceived of. My mention of my friend getting attacked by a grizzly bear might give you an eerie feeling the next time you go camping, but that feeling would probably be eased if I told you he walked away with just a small scar on his hand and that getting attacked by a grizzly bear is less likely than getting struck by lightning. But The Last of Us doesn't give us that info, and most of the audience wouldn't consider it on their own in real time. In that way, this story's premise quite excellently blends together three components of fear. Fear of what we don't understand, fear of what we do understand but is normally blissfully far from our minds, and fear created by a lack of information to set the tone for what has become an iconic series. <laughs>